Central neuroaxial block, broadly speaking, this encompasses spinal, epidural, and combined spinal epidural. Please like, subscribe, and comment. The direct uses of a spinal or epidural is to provide anesthesia or analgesia. Indirectly, they have multiple advantages. These include increased tissue oxygen delivery, reduces mortality in major surgery, reduces blood loss stress response, and also reduces complications of the respiratory tract, cardiovascular system, and the GI tract. Spinal techniques are usually performed below the spinal cord. The spinal cord ends at L1 and L2, so it can be formed usually at L2 to L5, but classically L3 to 4. Conversely, epidural techniques can be largely reached at any vertebral level from the cervical, thoracic, lumbar and sacral. Sacral epidurals are commonly used in children and these are known as caudals. The techniques for spinal and epidural are different and therefore the needles are also different. Spinal needles are usually between 18 and 27 gauge, classically 25 gauge. The needle itself is usually 8 to 9 centimetres but can be longer. The needle is attached to a needle hub which is clear to allow visualisation of CSF and blood and there is a stylet and a stylet hub. The needle is usually inserted using an introducer but however as the gauge reduces the width increases and therefore there is less need for an introducer with larger needles. Conversely, a Turing needle or epidural needle is 16 to 19 gauge. These are 8 cm long but can be longer with 1 cm markings. There is a Hoover tip. Wings, needle hub, stylet, stylet hub. These needles are wider to allow the insertion of a catheter and the Huber tip is curved to allow delivery of the catheter to the epidural space. As the needles are wider and they have a Huber tip, it means there's increased resistance and therefore it is easier to insert the needle into the epidural space as you're able to palpate the different layers through the back as you reach the epidural space. This diagram identifies the different layers which are passed through following insertion of the needle. So from skin, subcutaneous fat, supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament, ligament flavum, the epidural space, dura, arachnoid matter, and then into the CSF. So the epidural or spinal is inserted at the appropriate vertebral level in between two spinous processes. And the epidural is moved into the epidural space. And this is a potential space to allow insertion of a catheter. Conversely, a spinal moves into the CSF or intrathecal space to allow delivery of anaesthetic or analgesic agents. So when are central neuroaxial techniques inappropriate? These can be absolute or relative contraindications. Absolute will be patient refusal or local anaesthetic allergy. Relative, abnormal coagulation, increased NICP, neurological conditions, for example MS, valvular disease, for example aortic stenosis, cardiovascular instability, ongoing active infection or technical difficulty, i.e. a patient with scoliosis. The physiological consequences of central neuroaxial blockade are broad and are based on the height of the block. As the block height increases, the consequences become more severe. Breathing. Thoracic blocks result in intercostal paralysis. As this increases to the cervical region, patients can lose the phrenic nerve. Cardiovascular. Lower blocks of the lumbar and lower thoracic can result in hypotension by reduction in SVR and venous pooling. As the block increases, you may get a loss of the cardioaccelerator fibres, causing bradycardia and hypertension, and even higher blocks of the brainstem can result in inhibition of the vasomotor centre. Disability. Cervical block can result in Horner's syndrome, and also brainstem and cortex involvement can result in anaesthesia, secondary to blockade of the reticular activating system. GI effects. Loss of sympathetic innervation at T6 to L1, but if the vagus remains intact, the gut will be contracted, relaxed sphincters, and normal peristalsis. The kidneys are usually maintained well due to autoregulation. However, urinary tension can occur due to loss of the autonomic bladder control. Temperature. You usually get heat loss due to reduction of metabolic rate below the block, vasodilation, and loss of compensatory mechanisms. If we compare spinal and epidural techniques, spinals are a single shot, rapid onset, local anaesthetic provides a dense block. As the needle used has a higher gauge, there is a reduced risk of spinal hematoma. Conversely, epidurals can be topped up by a catheter. There is reduced cardiovascular consequences following central neuroaxial blockade. However, the block is more variable and it can be inserted at different vertebral levels. Complications are broad and relate to four different subgroups. 
As the needle is inserted, there's a risk of damage to structures. These structures can be the skin and muscle causing back pain, but also more important structures including nerves, the vasculature producing a hematoma, and that can result in spinal cord compression. You will get a dual puncture with a spinal needle, however this can inadvertently occur with an epidural needle, resulting in a post dual puncture headache. As we've discussed, there's a range of physiological effects which can cause hypotension, tachycardia, bradycardia, and also a range of respiratory and neurological complications. Indirect effects include infection and GI and GU complications. Also, the procedure may be difficult and requiring multiple attempts.